Hey guys, this is part two of the Unmasking NK series. This is from her second interview with investigators on August 16th, 2018. The interview takes place at the Thornton Police Department with agents Kevin Kobach and Tim Martinez. NK's dad accompanied her to the interview. She doesn't bring an attorney, which I find interesting considering the gravity of the situation. At this point, Shanann's body has been found and recovered and they are in the process of recovering the girls. So this is a whole different ball game. In this video, the flow is slightly different, so we will follow the order of the interview because there is a lot to go over. And again, I wanna say thank you and give a shout out to the amazing group of people that helped contribute to this video. So let's just get right down to it. It's hard not to get annoyed almost immediately listening to this. I know so far we've done basically kind of just the facts type of discussion, but this one is different. She's right out of the gate in this interview with lie after lie. When the interview begins, her tone is very quiet, subdued. She's mumbling. It's hard to understand her. The agent asks her to speak up so they can hear her and get it on the recording. Her tone changes drastically throughout the course of the interview. And this matters because it is August 16th, the day. They're recovering the girls from the tanks, and she is now fully aware of the scope of what's happened. The agents start right out wanting to know all about the relationship. So he asks her if she knew that Chris was married, and she responds he didn't have a wedding ring on his finger. As we know from watching what we posted in the first one, and if you haven't watched the first video, please do, because I'll be referencing that and connecting dots from that. You may not understand what I'm referring to if you don't, but as we know from the Google searches, all of the public posts that we show you in the first video, she would have seen him and Shanann together, what the status of their relationship is, the girls and the girls' names, which will come into play in just a minute. And that response is a sidestep of saying yes or no. And it means nothing because we know that she did know the full status of his marriage and relationship. And as you'll remember from video one, Nicole Googled Chris Watts on August 3rd, 2017 and Shanann Watts on September 1st, 2017 and January 7th, 2018. These were deleted searches. Um, and uh, he didn't have a wedding ring on his finger. And every time I talked to him, he didn't tell me that he was in a relationship. He didn't even mention his kids right away either. Um, and then one day he told me that he had two kids. I was like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, so tell me about his kids. That sounded like a sarcastic comment. No, I thought it was kind of cute. I was like, oh, he's a dad. It was like right around Father's Day too. So whenever that is, is in June? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm not good with holidays. He told me he had kids, and then it was Father's Day shortly after okay. that. So that's what I do now. And I was like, I know, I thought it was cute. And then um, he's telling me about him. He's pretty excited about him. And then um, he mentioned that he did have a significant other. And then he told me that those two were in the process of a separation. Did he mention the children's name or his significant other's name? Um, I didn't know his significant other's name for a while. And then I think he told me his kids' names pretty quick, but to be honest with you, on an exact date of when that happened, I don't know. I don't think it's really necessary to spend any more time on this topic. I think it's clear she was well aware of Shanann and the girls. In part one, the investigators briefly touched on when the relationship started. They circle back to it here. But at that point... We just, like, took it to his phone because I just felt it was, like, better that way. Um, and we just continued to talk. And then... Um, Let me go back to the park. Where's the park? It's, like, down the street from my house. It's called East Lake Number 3. Your your house? Yes. In Northland? Yes. And that was in the June time frame? I, yeah, or like, the beginning of July. It was, like, right around my birthday. It's like, so sometime at the very end of June or the beginning of July. Okay. And that's the first meeting you had outside of work. Yeah. Um, basic conversation for a first date? I mean, we kept it pretty simple, I guess. You know, um, I don't even remember everything we talked about. We sure. were there for a few hours. Um, but Understand my, so if, if I ask about conversation, what I'm looking for, was he talking about 
his family during any of these meetings? Those are the kind of, I understand, uh, every, you know, whatever you guys were talking about, relationship, your life, your interests, those things. That, we don't need to know that. What I'm interested in is knowing is when he brings up his children, when he brings up his wife, when he brings up financial information, when he brings up his home, when he brings up anything that may have been, and, and it's been a few days, so you've had a chance to reflect on um, some articles that you may have read, and you know, unfortunately, that you're in a situation where somebody has been murdered. And that information, when you look backwards um, in your memory with the conversations with Chris, anything that he might have said that would be relative to that, and I'm not just, you know, even if he one day he was mad and he said, I want to do this or do that, um, you know, anything like that. If he ever made any kind of statements that you were like, whoa, that was weird. Um, or why would he say that? Or why did he mention that? Do you understand what I'm, I'm no, looking I for? No, I completely understand. I just feel like some of this happened so long ago that I can't tell you, like, the exact words of the exact conversation at the exact time sure. and place because it's like we had a lot of conversations. I mean, we talked every single day. So it's so if like I'm trying to help you guys with the stuff like – the stuff that's more current, I can give you guys a lot more like detail and exact times. But when you're asking me about something that happened six weeks ago and exactly what was said, it's like, I mean, I'm sure I can give you a general idea, but to be honest with you, like to pinpoint exact words, it's not going to happen. She briefly discusses how much they had in common, that Chris was a gearhead and she was always interested in cars. She talks a lot about their common interest in health and fitness. She also talks about in these interviews, how Chris is an introvert, but around her, he said he could be himself. One of our commenters on video one had one of the best comments I've ever seen about NK, and I don't have permission to say her name, but um, she probably knows who she is, but she just is reiterating what I think as well. I don't know how many of you have either seen the movie or read the book Gone Girl. It's I love it, and it takes place in Missouri where I'm from, so I just, I like that author, but anyway, she, NK reminds me so much of something that Jillian Flynn describes in the book. So in the book, the main character is having an affair on his wife, and Jillian Flynn describes the cool girl. So I'll read you this little excerpt, and you let me know what you think. Being the cool girl means I'm a hot, brilliant, funny woman who adores football, poker, dirty jokes, and burping, who plays video games, drinks cheap beer, loves threesomes and anal sex, and jams hot dogs and hamburgers into her mouth like she's hosting the world's biggest culinary gangbang while somehow maintaining a size two because cool girls are, above all, hot. Hot and understanding. Cool girls never get angry. They only smile in a chagrined, loving manner and let their men do whatever they want. Go ahead, shit on me. I don't mind. I'm the cool girl. I think I'm going to try that for like a month and see where it gets me. I'm just kidding. Many times during the interview, he refers to the relationship as an eight-week relationship. I don't know if this is intentional or not, but she always makes it a point to correct him and state it was only six weeks. He then goes into more detail about where they spent their time. She says they always hung out at her place and goes on this long rambling thing about her space versus everyone else's space. Um, I do think that the reason that Shanann's car was seen parked down the street many times is because Nicole's truck was parked in their garage while Shanann was gone, and I do believe that she stayed over there more than twice. I know another commenter pointed this out as well, and I completely agree. As I'm sure you've noticed, when it's convenient for her, she stresses to him what a short relationship it was, and just kind of how unimportant, especially that first interview, she says basically she barely knew him, barely liked him, it was nothing, it's such a short amount of time. However, when he asks her to recall specific things that are important to them, she states it was so long ago that she can't remember. So she, it's just based on whatever is convenient for her depending on the question that is asked. And then just something that I noticed, I'm sure many of you did too, as far as the cell phone goes, that is kind of fascinating to me. Again, just talking about the demeanor throughout this, you know, her dad kind of cuts into this point and is asking questions about the cell phone. And when they're discussing giving the cell phone to the agents to get data extraction, she just comes across as being difficult. There's one point around 30 minutes where 
you can kind of hear some of Agent Kovac's patience waning a bit, which I don't blame him. I mean, he's been very gentle through this interview. I realize there's a kind of a power play here, if you will, because she didn't bring an attorney. They are desperate for information. They're recovering the bodies. They need her. They need and want her cooperation. And at any time she can leave, choose not to answer their questions and go lawyer up. So I get that they're both kind of trying to play this right to their advantage. So I'll even give her that I understand she's embarrassed about the potential of the you know, a lot of people seeing the nude pics and the raunchy texts, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. And he's assuring her that those aren't going to get out. And even he's telling her, you know, we're all adults. You can kind of hear it in his voice, like, you know, oh, well, there's kind of bigger things at play here. And she just seems to not understand that it's just not all about what she needs and what she's afraid of and her wants and needs. And that part, is telling to me of just who she is. Someone mentioned to me that she shows more emotion and concern in the part about giving over her cell phone than any other part of the interview, and I have to agree with that as well. I'm not looking at anything else except for the conversations between you and Chris Watts and the phone um, data between you and Chris Watts for phone calls for times and dates for those phone calls. Um, and then the content of the text messages that, that are there. And we can, we'll can write that specifically down here. Understand that I don't if, want anybody to get some of those texts. <laughs> like, they have nothing to do with this case, and they're just like... Between you and Chris? Yes, they're just... They're just... So just tell me what you're... They're just kind of raunchy. Okay, like, well, I don't need anybody... Everybody's an adult. <laughs> posted, like, We're not gonna somewhere. Post it. Um, it, the, I don't need... The I don't only want the ones newspapers that, to get that. That's all I want. The I only ones that we would be looking that. for, again, is the same kind of questions we're getting to here, is things about his children, things I'm about sure. his wife, the, sure. the questioning of did he ever, you know, has he ever said something to you that might indicate... Maybe not then, but now that there was something like this in his mind. Or you you know what we're looking for. I don't need to come out and tell you that. I understand the embarrassment of particular photos or potential um, sexual types of conversations you may have had with Chris. Uh, it's, it's not relative to the investigation. We don't care, okay? You're an adult. I'm an adult. Everybody in this room, is, even your dad, and... I give it to you for saying that stuff in front of your dad because I'm not sure many women could do that. Um, so that's not what we're, we're after. We're after the, the information that corroborates things that you've told us and also that corroborates or um, may tend to prove that things that Chris told us were a lie. You understand that? Mm -hmm. um, and that's maybe going a little bit far. I usually won't tell people that, but because of your reservations, that's what I'm looking for. If I can disprove something he's told me by a phone record, phone records don't lie. People do. Okay? So if I can disprove something that may be important, that's what I need it for. I'm not saying I can. Has it happened before? Absolutely. Is it critical in cases that I've worked in the past? Yes. So that's why I want it. Okay? Um, again, you don't have to give it to me. You can tell me I don't want you to have it. Go get a warrant. Um, I'm not even going to tell you if I go get a warrant, try to get a warrant right now. I'm just asking for you to consent. And, and again, we can write right here what you're willing to give me, which is the text messages and the phone log. And unfortunately, again, the, the attachments on some of those text messages. And I'll write it on there, and then you'll just sign it. Okay? Do you, under, do you understand the questions there? Do you have questions about any of the things that it says? You understand you don't have to do this. You're doing it of your own free will. And I know you're tired, so if you want to let your dad read it too. He will. Um, <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's a good idea. Can you fill it out before I sign it? Yep. And just you read it, and if you have any questions, then we'll, we'll put on there what we're after. You should have told me I would have got you some food. I got food in my car. It's not staying down. It's just coming. She hadn't been feeling good. Not because of any... Just like I got sick prior to gym. this whole, whole thing happening and then I think all of this compounding Stress. with the fact that I'm sick, it's just not good. I've not really been eating or sleeping much at all. Yeah, I... 
I'm with you. We definitely need to accelerate the case because the more long, the more it takes, the less sure that they are of situations. But on the other end, I think if we, if you do just that only, you tell me what you're willing to provide is that, to me, and we'll is that write good it enough. I just want like our text conversation and then I guess our phone call records. So I'm going to put um, so the time and date of the phone call records and then our text message. Could we get photos of him? Huh? Could we get photos of him? Off of Would that? Would you mind if we got his photos that he sent to you? Oh, well, there'll be in that text message thing. So all his photos were sent. There was no apps or anything else used no, that you no, guys no, no, were no, sending. No, 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 no. It was all just text messages. Yeah. Okay. So it'd be an attachment to a text that he sent you. Pretty much. But uh, everything is in the text and the phone call records. So like all of it. Because we don't have it on tape, we discussed prior to turning the tape on. Um, on Tuesday, which would have been the 14th of August. Um, you had read some newspaper articles on the 13th and the 14th that regarded this case. You had also had a conversation with Chris at some point during the day on Monday. Uh, and on Tuesday, because of what you found, specifically what you said was, and I don't let me put words in your mouth, but you knew, you found out that his um, wife was pregnant. And I, yes. And you did not know that prior. No. And you found that out via the newspaper articles, and that caused you concern. Um, well, I just realized that he was lying to me, and I was like, well, if you can lie to me about this, what else are you lying to me about? And it made me realize that maybe his wife was in danger at that point, and it was day two, too, and she still wasn't home. What did that cause you to do with your phone, though? Oh, what, when I deleted those? Yeah. I was just kind of grossed out by him, to be honest with you. I was just like, I don't know what's going on right now, but you just lied to me, and I don't want to see this come over my phone anymore. So I removed it. So you re just, you already said, but you removed text messages? I deleted all of his stuff because he lied to me. I mean, that's what it was. It was, it was the hurt that made me delete it. And then it was the lie that made me start questioning everything else he'd been telling me for the last few days. And that's when you decided to come forward? Yes. Okay. So just for context, yes. when people delete stuff off phones, usually we go... No, 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 no. It wasn't malicious why I wanted, at right. all. It no, wasn't not malicious, malicious at all. He, he, he lied to me. It just hurt. Like, I had never felt like he'd ever lied to me before. And it was a big lie. I mean, right. telling somebody that you're in the midst of a divorce and then you have a wife that has a 15-week-old baby on the way is a huge huge thing and I was very taken back and I was just it was hurt and so at that point I just I like deleted it I had a, I had a few more quick things to say to him and then I just got rid of him that's literally what I did I just cut him out of my life it would honestly been like a bad breakup kind of thing like if none of this other stuff would have happened that's what it would have been that would have been the end of it the information was not destroyed because there was anything in there that would be uh, harmful to you or p potentially to Chris at this point, but harmful to you in particular. That's not what you did. No, 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 You no, did no. it out of, uh, excuse my language, this guy's an asshole, so I'm getting it rid of him, and I'm getting this stuff off my phone. That was like me kicking him out of my life. Okay. And then, like I said, and then realizing that he lied, that was when I was like, okay, maybe his family is in danger and they're not coming back and they're not staying with a friend. Yeah, when did I go over there? Tuesday morning? Wednesday morning. Wednesday. I called you Wednesday morning. That's when we started discussing you guys need to get everything that I just... You can understand the importance of... Oh, no question. We were... Like I said, people lie with phone records down um, and they really help specifically um, establish dates and times. Mm -hmm. I think we have a very good grip on that in this case already, but there may be a time when we go, we need to know something else, and then we would have it. We don't want to lose it, and that's that's really what it is for us. Is If we lose information that later on we go, man, I wish we would have got that, and we may never even use these. We may never even look at them, but if, if we have it now, then we don't worry about losing it. So I appreciate you being cooperative and giving it to us. Yeah. When discussing the cell phone, N.K. asks her dad if there's anything else he wants to add. 
and he responds to the investigators with, we want to give you everything, but we also want to be protected in doing so. Then I guess our question would be, if you're being honest and forthcoming with investigators and you are providing them with everything they want, then protected from what? At the time of this interview, after all, it's only three days after they disappeared and they're just now finding their bodies. I don't see how they would be able to offer them any kind of, you know, exchanges or assure them of any protection when they still had so much to investigate. So the whole exchange is just strange. It's 44 minutes into the interview before Shanann, Bella, or Cece's names are mentioned at all. And that's because the agent brings it up and insists on it. Let's go back to North Carolina. Okay. He went to North Carolina and he was trying to rehab his marriage with his wife. Uh, he said Chad, do you he know her going. name at this point? Yeah. Okay. Are you okay saying her name? Uh, it's Shanann. All right. And do you know the children's name? Yes, it's Bella and Celeste. Okay. Cece. She went by, they called her Cece? Mm -hmm. N.K. seems to be very knowledgeable about what happened in North Carolina before and during Chris's visit. She tells the agent that they agreed Chris would go out there to work on his marriage, and then she acknowledges that it, quote, sounds silly. After the 45-minute mark, things start to get really shady. Chris said in the letters from Christopher book that N.K. did text him when he was at the airport heading to North Carolina and said something along the lines of, why don't you go work on your marriage? He then said she texted him later that night, which was July 31st, and was angry that he wouldn't call her. He says that she texted him something like, why can't you call me? Are you with her? If you'll remember, this is the same night Shanann was extremely sick, and Chris claims he drugged her with Oxy to get her to miscarry. This is also 24 hours after NK had a 22-minute phone call to a rehab center after hanging up with Chris and then immediately calling him right back. So now if you look at this comment that she brings up multiple times to investigators that she's using to portray herself in a certain way, I think you can see right through it. It would be interesting to hear a man's take on this. I think most of us women can see this was most likely a passive aggressive comment because she was really insecure about him going to be with Shanann. When I imagine this, I hear this more in a catty way like, why don't you go work on your marriage then? Chris doesn't seem to pass these types of tests. Just like on July 14th when NK storms out of their house and Chris doesn't follow her, he either doesn't care or he doesn't pick up on social cues, but either way, these do not work on him. We know that she's yet again misleading investigators here because if that's really how she felt, she would have just ended the relationship when he went to North Carolina. But we know that Chris was calling her a lot while he was there. He was being very cold to Shanann and the girls. And we also know that NK was sending him a lot of sexually explicit photos. It's also worth noting that on the day that Shanae and Chris got back from North Carolina, August 7th, on her phone records, there's a one-minute call that NK made to North Glen Police Department. It is on their main number, and assuming that they answer that, it looks like she must have called and hung up. This part is interesting because we feel like she kind of trips herself up here. She tells investigators that she really did believe they were getting separated because he could call her whenever he wanted. She then goes on to say that she would insist he goes and spend time with his kids when they were awake and to call her after they went to bed. She mentions how it was frustrating for her to have to wait to talk to him after he got home from work, but he would call her after his kids went to sleep and that he would be in the basement and Shanann would be upstairs. The problem with that is that if they actually did start seeing each other at the end of June or July, Shanann and the girls were gone the entire time. So what is she talking about? In the six weeks she claims they were together, the girls were home six nights and Shanann was home with him a total of three nights. They ask her if she ever saw the basement and she says that yes, she did go look around the basement and she saw the bed set up and how organized it was down there and his workout equipment. She talks about how she walked around the house, but she specifically denies ever going into the master bedroom. She then is off and running for at least 10 minutes talking about how she was trying to help him and find good places to live and what towns to live in, talking about the real estate market, talking about even at one point how she encourages her friends to read. We're kind of all over the place here. She also makes it a point to tell investigators that she told Chris she wanted to take the relationship really slow for their sake and for the girl's sake, 
and that she wanted to stay in her own place that they had not talked about moving in together. Notice that the two hour search that NK makes for wedding dresses is while he's in North Carolina, quote unquote, working on his marriage. I think it's a beautiful thing. And I really try to like take it smart with all that. And it was the same thing with his kids. So it was just like, you know, like, and I, and we talk about things every once in a while where I, you know, I'd be like, Hey, if I ever meet, you know, cause like I have a lot of house plants. That's a good example. So I have a lot of house plants and I told, I told him, I was like, one day, if I ever meet your kids, I was like, I'm going to show these girls how to like paint pottery and plants plants. It was like, I think they would love to see something grow that they built. I think it would be really, really cute. And like little stuff like that, but it wasn't very frequent. It wasn't, hey, we should get married and hey, we should have babies and hey, I want to live with you and hey, I need to meet your children now and let's cut the mom out. It was never like that. And that was, it, there was never any conversation about, you know, we can't do this with her around. We can't do this with the kids around. No. He never said that. You never no. said that. No. No. So there, the the way you guys were trying to make this work was just you know slowly trying to come together because of his current situation and you, by your own account your own mine I mean, you're I you're just a, a independent person it sounds like pretty much yeah. and uh, but through text message or through conversation he never said hey uh, you know. This isn't going to be financially able. I'm not going to be financially able to do this, or this isn't a good thing. I got these kids. N none of those conversations ever came up. No, I mean he told me like he had a budget restriction. So for his apartment, and I'm pretty sure this is in the text, and this will probably be in the last couple of weeks. Um, he told me 1,100 to 1,400 when I was asking him, like, because I told him I'd help him do homework. I was like, you do some homework. I'll do some homework. We'll knock this out because if you guys are for real putting the house up you got to figure it out. Um, and so that was his budget. And I remember asking him, I was like, you sure you don't want to just get like a house? And he's like, I never thought about a house. I'm like, yeah, you can rent houses, man. Like it's a thing. And he's just like, I don't know if I can afford that. And I was like, okay. And I knew that those two had been through some financial trouble. I definitely found out a lot more about that situation in the newspaper recently. Um, Okay, so prior to the newspaper, how did you know he was in financial difficulty? Because he, I mean, I, when I went to that house, everything in there is very, 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 very nice. It looks like it all comes with a very expensive price tag. And uh, I didn't say anything to him about it, but I could kind of tell then where I was, like, just looking at everything, like, how do you guys afford this? And then he has that car. I don't even know how much that car costs, but what I bet car, it, what car is that it? Lexus. I'm sure that thing costs like 80 grand, but just like money, like everything just looked like it costs a lot of money in that house. You probably have a decent idea of how much money he makes. Yeah, and it's not enough money to pay for all that. Not um, even close. Did you have any idea of what um, Shanann did for a living or how much money she might have made? I mean, I had an idea. I don't, I mean, I would consider her like a sales rep. I don't know how else to describe that. Um, for the company that she worked for. And uh, I don't know exactly how much she made. He said that she was really competitive and she liked to try to keep up with him. He was like, she gets close sometimes. Aside from the content of the clips you're hearing, in our opinion, her entire affect is completely inappropriate for what the situation is. We're talking about the deaths of a pregnant mom and her two small children who were discovered that very day. She appears nonchalant and many times chipper during the interview. And then you mentioned today you read something about uh, bankruptcy. Yep. What did you read? That those guys filed bankruptcy for a lot of money in. Who are those guys? To that that couple. Okay. In 2015. Oh, Shannon and Chris. Thanks. Filed bankruptcy <laughs> in 2015. Okay. And you said for a lot of money. Do you recall the amount? No, because it was different in each of the newspapers, and I don't know which one to believe. Okay. So, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. At this point in the interview, there's a really strange exchange between Agent Kobach and her dad. So I'll play it for you. Yes, I think, I know why he lied to me. He lied to me because if I'd have known that he had a child on the way, I'd have never wasted my time with him in the first place. Like, none of this would have ever even occurred if he would have just told me the truth. So do you think if he found out that you, um, if, let's say this week you guys were to go look at some apartments, and this is hypothetical, 
but you um, you've never found out that his wife was pregnant. Would would that have changed anything? Uh, like you just said, if I knew he was his wife was pregnant, I wouldn't be in this picture. So if his wife was not pregnant, um, and forgive me, but if 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 he takes her out of the picture, you're never going to know that she was pregnant, right? What do you mean, takes her out of the picture? Like if, if he murdered her, she's out of the picture. You're never going to know if she was pregnant. If he can get away with murder, you're not going. to... I got divorced from my wife. You say, do you understand what I'm saying here? If if she's gone, but this don't lead hypothetically, please. Don't hypothetically, lead if she. Okay. You understand what, where I'm going. If right, you didn't you're, know, you're leading into right. questions that are if, nothing with your. If you didn't know, though. Wait, Nick. That she was there. Did you hear what I said? I'm not. I'm following you. I just want her to answer a question that relates to. She said something that's important. That if he didn't have a child on the way, she, or if he didn't, if she didn't know that, she would have continued the relationship, right? But he killed his kids. At what point does he think that I'm going to be not, in a relationship? I'm not talking about the children. I'm just talking specifically about her. If, if, if you only knew, if the kids were still here, and he called you and said, "I'm divorced from my wife," and he gets away with this, do you understand what I'm thinking from his aspect? I still wouldn't do it. I still wouldn't do it because I'd be like. Where did she go? Investigators ask her about where they went Saturday night, and she tells them how he got a babysitter, and they went to the two different lazy dogs. She remembers exactly where they sat in the restaurant, but she does not remember what they talked about. She goes off on tangents about how Chris has lost a lot of weight, and how healthy he eats, and how healthy she eats, and how she was able to lose weight quickly when she started eating clean, and they keep having to redirect her back to the topic at hand. He asks her if they talked about Shanann being out of town, and she says yes, briefly they did, and that she would be home late Sunday night. And this part caught me a little off guard, as it appears it did Agent Kobach as well, but he says, so you talked to Chris a couple hours Sunday night, and her response is, did I? And he says, he kind of laughs in kind of disbelief, it sounds like to me, that's my interpretation. And she's like, well, are you telling me or are you asking me? She's almost acting cute here. I, I don't, again, I don't understand this woman's demeanor at all. There's no question who's trying to be alpha in this interview, and it's completely ridiculous. He asks her if the girls have any allergies, and she starts talking about Cece's nut allergy, and then goes right from there into her interpretation of the fight that broke out in North Carolina over the nuts. She then mentions that she was talking to Chris about the fact that he hadn't talked to his family and about the fight and then starts talking to Agent Kobach about the importance of family. During the last 20 to 30 minutes of this interview, she starts getting really tired and she's getting sloppy and she's contradicting herself all over the place. For example, she now tells investigators that she was out of town the last few days of June and the first couple of days of July. When this entire time, she's maintained that this is when they first got together outside of work and began an intimate relationship. She also mentions a text that investigators will see when Chris was in North Carolina telling Chris not to tell her he loves her if he's going to lay down next to a quote-unquote other woman after insisting she had told him to go work on his relationship. At this point, NK gets emotional for the first time about what's happened with the girls and I know we have our own take on this, so I'll just play it for you so you can form your own opinions. Long term, it's like, you know, I'm going to wake up every day and know that, like, this mom and her unborn child and these two little girls are not around anymore. And it breaks my heart. It is so, oh my God. And, and, and then I have to think about, like, the consequences of his actions and how they affect everybody else. Like, all of these, her family's impacted. My name is about to be like slandered for probably a while. I don't know how long it's going to take to heal, but I would not be surprised if it's going to be hard to go out in public sometimes for a couple of years. And that really hurts me. I'm just like, this is a horrible, horrible thing. Like, how dare you? You know, and, and people aren't going to understand that. You know, they're going to say, oh, you know, you're the woman that had an affair with this man who took out his whole family. And I take a step back and it's just like, I didn't 
no. Like, I, I, ugh. It's, he's so disgusting. I'm so ashamed of him and everything, and I just, talked a little bit earlier about getting some help for these things and we can provide that. Okay. At, at really no cost. Through the well, we're more can we just want to make sure uh, there's resolution. Absolutely. That's why we come to you guys to yeah. pound, this, and pound it down. Hey, until I, there's I'm nothing sorry left. that you're talking again today. I really am. I don't want to put you through any more trauma than you've already been through. There is um, reasons for everything that we're doing today and what, what occurred. And I'm sorry. I genuinely am sorry. I, it, these are not things that we like to do twice. It's the same thing with other types of victims from other crimes. We want to do it once and we want to be done. Unfortunately, we didn't know yesterday um, what we know today. And that's why we're here, because we need this video. And I'm, I am sorry, because I know it's hard to talk about it. But God, it's it, so it's, sad and she's pregnant. And, you know, on, on our end, we God, didn't... God, they're so cute. They're so little. Like, why? 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 How? I don't even understand how you could, like, bring yourselves to do that to somebody who's, like, that big. out for a minute? No, I just need to turn with my eyes closed for a sec. I still cannot believe this is happening. Alright, let's keep going because we're just let's getting to the, like, the meat of this whole let's situation. Let's get to the phone call on Saturday from 9 to 11. Agent Kobeck again tries to talk to her about what was discussed during the 111-minute phone call on Sunday night, August 12th. He's giving her prompts that lead us to believe that he kind of has the same thought process we do. It's kind of a big deal. Shanann's getting back. She's going to be back full time. Everything is going to change. It's hard to believe they didn't discuss that at all, but she sticks to the fact she just can't remember. She tells him that she doesn't think it's anything of relevance and that she, what she does remember is that she thought it was odd he was up watching TV and she could hear it in the background and that normally when they talk at night they're both laying in bed and they're falling asleep and she could hear him around and she wondered to herself if he was waiting up for Shanann. He finally gets it out of her that during that phone call, they did discuss Chris going straight out to the field before work in the morning. She vaguely mentions that he said he had to go check out a valve or something where they thought they had a release. She told investigators that it's not uncommon for the operators to go straight out to the sites and not into the office in the morning. Completely contradictory to that, however, coworker Anthony Brown says in his interview that it is extremely unusual. He asks her what she did on Sunday and she says that she can't remember her brain is a quote mashed potato and she just can't remember. Her dad interjects and asks when Jim came into town and she says Monday. She finally kind of sits there and just says she can't remember and then asks the agent if she can just get back to him on that. Her dad interjects and says that they all went to the museum on Sunday after they went to brunch and then she mentions that she skipped brunch to go to the gym because it's core day. She then tells investigators that she knows there's things that she needs to tell them and they will get to them as the days progress, but she's really tired at this point. Then her dad asks her, what about that nine o'clock thing you were telling me on Monday? And NK says, oh, that thing he was telling me? Oh yeah, we'll get there. We're still on Sunday. Yet they never get back to it. She tells investigators that she talked to Chris Monday morning, but then she kind of rambles on and becomes more vague and says she doesn't remember the exact context. She does mention that she showed another agent her time card for that day. 
At this point, she tells them for the first time about Jim. She says that she clocked out at 3 o'clock that afternoon, and then when she got home around 3.45 p.m., that Jim was already there because he has a key and is one of her best friends for years. She says that around the time she got home at 3.45, Chris texted her that his family was gone or something to that extent or not home, and that she continued to talk to and entertain Jim while kind of casually texting Chris. You can see here in the transcription of the interview, she tells investigators that Chris actually texts her three different times asking her to call him, but that she was kind of alerted but not really and keeps entertaining Jim. She says that she waited about 15 to 20 minutes and then stepped outside to call Chris. But if you look at the phone records, she made two attempts to call him at 501 and 502, so it was more like she waited an hour and 15 minutes to call Chris. She says that after he didn't answer, that she can't remember if they talked on the phone or if it was through text, but they were going back and forth and he told her that the cops were there and that her friend Nikki had called the cops. She says that because Jim was there, she was just basically looking down every once in a while at her phone. I find it hard to believe that after Chris tells her the cops are there, that she's nonchalantly glancing at her phone every once in a while. This is also where she makes the statement, why would this girl call the cops, referring to Nicole Atkinson. So interestingly, there's a 5.30 p.m. call where Chris tries to call NK and she doesn't answer. It's not on this original bill, but it is in discovery as a deleted call. And according to cell phone records, they don't speak on the phone until 9.48 p.m. that night. So without all of her deleted texts, it's really hard to tell what she's saying here is accurate and what isn't. But again, it doesn't really make sense with such a serious situation going on that she would wait that long to get a hold of him just because Jim was over. The interview pretty much cuts off right here. The only other thing that's talked about is Jim. They're asking her for Jim's information and she gets very upset and actually says to them, leave Jim alone, just leave Jim alone. And they keep asking her for his information and she keeps declining to give it to them. She also tells them that Jim knows nothing about what happened and nothing about Chris. So that's it for NK's interview on August 16th. The next interview is a phone interview on August 17th.